Are we real or do we live in a simulation? And is there any proof? Doubting the perception of reality has been an intriguing topic for centuries. You're about to discover why many believe there is a 50-50 chance that we do live in a simulation. Now get ready to explore the blurry lines of having our minds tricked into believing that what we know as a certain reality could simply be a digital creation. For those who don't know what the simulation theory is, it's the concept that we're all virtual beings living in some kind of computer simulation, much like the setting in some sci-fi movies like The Matrix. And it's no surprise that the subject keeps coming up over and over again, considering the current radical development and speed of advanced technology. You might be wondering where this hypothesis originated, and it's probably not what you think. In fact, we need to go as far back as ancient China, when Taoist philosopher Zi Huang Chou had a dream and wrote that he was a butterfly with no recollection of his human form. In the dream, he was exploring the world, fluttering through the air without a care. Suddenly, Chou awakens and pinches himself to see if he was dreaming, and realizes he's human after all. Or is he? Could it be that he was a butterfly dreaming about being a human? The important thing here is that Zi Huang Chou wrote that he believed his experience was a transformation of consciousness and awareness. One exists in reality and the other is an illusion, leading one to wonder, which one is which? Fast forward to the modern age, a Sweden-born philosopher by the name of Nick Bostrom made several proposals based entirely around post-human civilization. He published a paper called Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? which put forth the question, and we quote, if there was a substantial chance that our civilization will ever get to the post-human stage and run many ancestor simulations, then how come you're not living in such a simulation? Since Bostrom published his work, there's been intent public speculation and debate about the nature of reality. In 2016, Elon Musk was on stage at Recode's Code Conference when The Verge co-founder Josh Topolsky was about to ask him if he thought our existence was simulated. Musk jumped in real quick and began explaining an example that we've gone from the very first video game, Pong, to massively multiplayer online games that have photorealistic graphics with millions of simultaneous players. And now we're going on to a new genre of virtual and augmented reality games, which he believes will become so realistic that it'll be hard to tell what is real and what is not. Now, whether you're a fan of Elon Musk, he did have a point when he said that if we assume any rate of improvement at all, then games would become indistinguishable from reality. He went on and said that even if the rate of improvement drops by a thousand from what it is now, and imagining we're 10,000 years into the future, which is nothing on the evolutionary scale, the odds we're living in base reality is one in billions. The scary thing is that Elon Musk said that if a civilization stops advancing, then it's likely due to a calamitous event that erases civilization. Musk said that there are two options. Either we're going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality, or civilization will cease to exist. But are we simply avatars being guided by some super intelligent creatures in another reality? It's a little mind-blowing if you think that there's a 50-50 chance that we live in a simulation. In fact, even astrophysicist and planetary scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson has given the idea some credence to the theory that we're in a simulation. But there are also many skeptics too. Another physicist by the name of Frank Wilczek argued that there is too much wasted complexity for our world and universe to be simulated. Building complexity requires energy and time. We need to ask ourselves the question, why would a conscious, intelligent designer of realities waste so many resources into making our world more complex than it needs to be? Others have argued that the question isn't scientific anyway, and since the simulation hypothesis can't be tested or proven, it's not really worth investigating. However, all these discussions and studies of the simulation hypothesis may have missed a key element of scientific inquiry, empirical assessment and data collection. So to understand if we're actually living in a simulation, we need to start by looking at the fact that we already have computers running different types of simulations for lower-level intelligences or algorithms. 
To visualize this, imagine these so-called intelligences as NPCs or non-player characters that you'll find in many massively multiplayer online role-playing games. These NPCs don't need to be intelligent or even conscious, and they don't need to be very complex, because the evidence we're looking for is experienced by all simple or complex computer programs running on all computers regardless if they are slow or fast. All computer hardware leaves an artifact of its existence within the world of the simulation it's running, and this artifact is processor speed. For the record, when we say artifact in this context, we're talking about the central processing unit which was designed and made by human hands. Imagine for a moment you're a software program running on a computer. The only artifact of the hardware supporting you is the processor speed. All other laws you would experience would be the laws of the simulation or the software you're part of. If you were a sim from SimCity or a character in something like World of Warcraft, these would be the laws of the game world. However, anything you do to push the simulation would also be considered by the processor speed, no matter the laws of the game. In other words, the processing speed dictates a physical reality onto the operation that's detached from the simulated reality of the operation itself. And no matter how complete the simulation is, the processing speed would limit the operations of the simulation. That said, if we do indeed live in a simulation, then our universe should also have an artifact. Therefore, we need to look at some properties of our universe to figure out exactly what this artifact could be. It would have to be an artifact that presents itself in the simulated world as an upper limit. Also, the artifact cannot be explained by underlying mechanistic laws of the simulated universe. It would have to be accepted as an assumption or given within the operating laws of our simulated universe. And the last thing is that the artifact or anomaly would be absolute, no exceptions. Now that we've defined some properties of the artifact, we'll give you a few seconds to see if you've already guessed what this artifact in our universe might be. If you guess the artifact is the speed of light, then pat yourself on the back. It surely fits the properties and the limit of the artifact in a simulation running on any computer. And it remains the same regardless of observer speed. It's defined as a maximum limit, and so far, it's unexplainable by the physics of the universe, and it certainly is absolute. Therefore, we could easily come to the conclusion that the speed of light hardware artifact proves we live in a simulated universe. This brings up an interesting observation about the nature of space in our universe. If we are indeed living in a simulation, then the space is an abstract property written in code. In other words, it's not real. Considering our universal speed limit, this is probably why we're not able to move from galaxy to galaxy, because they might not be real either, and we have no way to reach them, ever. But this isn't the only thing that proves we might be living in a simulation. The most likely clue might be hiding right in front of our eyes, or rather, behind them. To explain this, imagine a character from a role-playing game such as The Sims or World of Warcraft. The algorithm that represents the character and the algorithm that represents the game environment which the NPC operates in is intertwined on many levels. However, if we assume that the character and the environment or game world are separate, the non-player character doesn't need a visual projection of its point of view to interact with the environment. The simulation algorithms take into account some of the environment variables and some of the character's state variables to project and determine the behavior of both the character and the environment. What we see on the screen is for our benefit, or to be able to experience the sensation of being in the game. Another similar example is movies. Some films often go into the point of view of characters to show us what's going on from their perspective. This has no purpose for the characters of the film, and once again, is only for our benefit. But this brings us to something else that needs to be considered, and that is consciousness. Why do we need it, and what purpose does it serve? If we concede that we're living in a simulation, the purpose is easy to define. Consciousness can be described as an integrated interface between the self and the rest of the universe. Therefore, the only reasonable explanation for its existence is that it simply exists to be an experience. And think about this for a moment. There's nothing in philosophy or science, theories or laws that would predict the emergence of this experience that we call consciousness. Natural laws don't call for its existence, and it certainly doesn't offer us any evolutionary advantages. So there can only be two explanations for the existence of our consciousness. One is that perhaps there are evolutionary forces at work that we don't know about yet that select for the emergence of consciousness or experience. 
The second is that the experience is some function that we serve, or perhaps a product that we create. Experience generated as human beings. But if this is the case and consciousness doesn't serve us in any way, who are we creating this product of experience for? How would they receive this experience? One thing is certain, we do create it. We only know that it exists and there's no theory to explain why we need it. If we're generating a product called consciousness that we don't seem to have any use for, the most logical conclusion is that this product serves someone else. Now consciousness is another big topic and if you'd like to see a video on that, how it began and evolved, let us know. Think about when you're playing a game. In a role-playing game, the experience of the characters is different from the experience of the player. Players feel some of the joys or disappointments that are designed for the character to feel, and the character experiences the consequences of the player's behavior. Yes, it's a rudimentary connection between the player and the NPC, but with virtual reality devices, the boundaries start to blur. For example, when riding a roller coaster as a character in a virtual reality game, we feel the gravity. You gotta ask yourself, where is the feeling of gravity coming from? Well, it exists in the space between the character riding the roller coaster and our minds occupying the mind of the character. We could be experiencing some small part of the experience ourselves, while a more information-rich version of the experience is being projected to some other mind for whose benefit the experience of consciousness first came into existence. The simplest explanation for the existence of consciousness is that it's an experience being created by us, but not for us. In other words, our product is most likely for the benefit of someone else experiencing our lives through us. Now that we've given the possibilities for the simulation hypothesis, do you think there are powerful forces at play controlling our lives? Or is the simulation theory the ultimate conspiracy theory? We'd like to hear what you've got to say. If it's true, then all we can do is come to terms with the reality of the simulation and make the best of it. Thanks for watching.